Hello everybody and welcome back to the stage here in Hall 1. We're just about to start the second presentation in this hall with the amazing Valerie Hodges from University of Tasmania, where she is the Diving Officer and Safety and Wellbeing Advisor and she really has a passion for human factors and safety differentially. Um, the title for this presentation is Prevention is Not Enough, and Valerie will be speaking about how much effort we make, and regardless of how much effort we make to prevent diving incidents, they will still occur. So we must also be able to respond when things go badly. In this session, session she will use a simple visual model to show how we can balance prevention, innovation in the moment, and response to an event and highlights how learning creates a feedback loop to dynamically improve the entire system. So I'll hand over the stage to you, Valerie, now, and I please ask you to start thinking about your questions because there is a Q&A session in the end of this presentation and please write down and be able to, and be prepared to put your questions forward to Valerie after her presentation. So good, Valerie, stage is yours. You're muted, Thank you so baby. much, Anders. Today I meet you from across Lutruita, that's Tasmania, Aboriginal land, sea and waterways, and pay my respects to elders, past, present and emerging. I acknowledge that it is a privilege to stand on country and to walk in the footsteps of those before us. Our island is deeply unique, and I invite you for a few minutes to join me here on the land of the Mwanina people, who belong to the oldest continuing culture in the world. For those not familiar with Tasmania, we're that little bit, that island at the southeast corner of Australia. This is a view from my veranda just a few days ago as we jump into spring here in the Southern Hemisphere. I also acknowledge that in this conference today are people from around the world, wherever you are, whatever you're looking at through your window today. Take a human moment to appreciate those that came before you. I'm also grateful to Gareth, his support team, and to all of you for making the effort to come together today. It is by no accident that Gareth has assembled an incredible lineup of speakers, supporters, and delegates. And speaking of accidents, they happen in diving. Whether you dive for work, for fun, whether you use scuba, rebreathers, or really any other technology, whether you dive deep, shallow, difficult, environments, or benign. Stuff happens. And it happens despite our best efforts, our best people, our best procedures for diving. We have incidents. We simply cannot prevent them all. But we live in a world where preventing incidents is the go-to in safety thinking. We call this prevention bias. And particularly where an activity is more complex or carries higher consequences like diving, it's simply not that helpful. So instead, we need to consider how we can balance our efforts to pre prevent a thing with our capacity, that ability to respond when things go wrong. We call this resilience. So let me unpack this just a bit further for you. So first, prevention bias is based on the assumption that we can prevent all events. One of the prime reasons given for why we investigate, or in our language, we do learning reviews, is to prevent future occurrence. But prevention bias is also based on the misplaced confidence that we have all the right controls, all the right safety measures in place, and they will hold. For example, we may become overly confident our second stage hose is new and it's in good order and it won't fail until it does. Prevention bias also does not acknowledge the existence of drift. That's that gradual degradation, or as Sidney Decker describes it, the incremental decline of our processes. This is where we tend to normalize risk. But drift is often only seen with hindsight, so like after an accident. The thing is, we pretty much all do it. When I started teaching diving, my briefings were really thorough but through time I began to drift, to save time to be more efficient. 
Todd Conklin, I love the way he says this. He likes to say, when you are in boiling water and you are the toad, you don't know it's boiling, right? So drift exists and a prevention bias does not acknowledge it. But what if instead of focusing just solely on prevention, we pursued a fail safe approach? If we focused on reducing the damaging energy, on protecting and removing people from it, if we build in redundancies. Todd Conklin, again, suggests posing these three questions that you see on your screen. When you do this job, what will kill you or hurt you? When that happens, what keeps you from dying? When, not if, but when that happens, what keeps you from dying? And is that enough? These questions, these three questions, tend to break through that bias of prevention and it spreads your controls, your safety measures over all three, what he describes as pillars of safety. So that's prevention, that's task execution, or in my language, operations, and response. So what we're saying here, the message is that we need to invest in prevention, but we also need to be able to respond. And think about it, that's why we teach rescue courses. That's why we use regulators that are engineered to fail safely. It's why we include redundancies in our diving equipment and we plan for what to do when things go badly. Obviously, the good news is diving already has some really good stuff in place to help us be more resilient. And speaking of resilience, this slide frames it well. This is from, again, Sidney Decker. And his work here offers a snapshot view that most of the work goes right or goes well. That's that big bit, big bit in the middle of the graph. On the extreme left of the graph, we see how some things go very badly. So think about maybe the latest fatality in diving you've heard about. But on the right-hand side, these are some outcomes that are very positive. This is where people jump in, where they sometimes heroically respond and fix things. Think about the Thailand cave rescue. That was pretty heroic. <laughs> But unfortunately, most of the sort of focus, if you will, that traditional view of safety is on that very small sample of bad things happening on the left side of the graph. But when we focus on this, we can miss the bigger picture. The bigger picture of what makes diving safer, what makes it more productive and more resilient. So what I'm saying here is safety is not the absence of the negative, but it's the presence of capacities. That is resilience. So this session offers a model that we're using here at the University of Tasmania as a simple visual framework. And I'm going to give you the backstory of how we use it to get people talking, to learn from our experiences, and to better understand each other by sharing a language of safety differently. The model I'm sharing with you is an adaptation of the bow tie. For those not familiar with the bow tie approach to safety, I'll describe it in a minute. But first, a little context. The University of Tasmania has a large scientific diving program. In fact, one of the largest in Australia. And the journey for us in this really began with an incident where the loss of the buddy system was implicated. Now, rather than just jumping in and blaming this on one team or one person, we started looking at the bigger picture. And our initial questions left us still quite curious about the extent of understanding and use of the buddy system as one of our primary safety measures for diving. In a mentoring moment, my manager suggested that I use the bow tie as a point of discussion and hold some forums with our divers to explore this a bit further. Over time and applying this curious bow tie, if you will, approach, to other situations, including a bunch of non-diving situations, we started to modify the bow the, that bow tie model. But hold that thought for just a minute because I think I should clarify something. And that's what we mean by the buddy system. So look, there's a number of definitions and ways of thinking about the buddy system. And we accept that lots of different um, disciplines in, in, in diving use different um, definitions. But let me be clear, we are doing scientific diving in Australia. 
and that means we must use the Australian standard. So for our operations, divers have a duty of care. And the specific language in the standard is to maintain effective two-way communication, visual contact with, and direct access to each other. Now look, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can do this and we can accomplish that. But the litmus test for us is whether we can immediately recognize a problem and render assistance. So again, we facilitated some sessions with our divers starting with that basic bow tie. Now, the bow tie is so named for its shape. On this left side of the bow tie here that you see on the prevention side, prevention efforts deter threats. While on the right side, the capacity to respond to an event can reduce its impact. So it might go from being a fatality to, to just maybe a, an injury or even instead of a serious injury, a very minor injury. So we use this bow tie structure to brainstorm threats and how the buddy system might prevent incidents. What can go wrong that the, dive, that the buddy system can prevent? Well, this became a pretty long list and it included everything from noticing an equipment problem during a buddy check to monitoring gas supplies during a dive to having two sets of eyes to spot issues before they became a problem. But we also recognize we cannot eliminate all the threats, all that stuff on that left-hand side. So we mapped out how the buddy system might be used to respond and minimize the impacts when things go badly. And obviously all the, the obvious things that you know came to mind here, that things like dealing with a low gas situation, um, diver rescues, but it also included some less obvious things, like the ability to blend skills and expertise on a research dive, to have better problem solving on the science side, to get better outcomes. Things like mentoring, cross-training, building a team's longer-term capabilities to do the science, but also to respond to diving problems. In the end, though, we also acknowledge that we can't control all of the impacts. And Back on that side of prevention, we also wanted to dive a little bit deeper into the concept of threats and explored the notion of complexity. The fact is threats often don't come alone. Sometimes they bring friends. And when we unpack accidents, we often see this same complexity in terms of causation. A lot of the accident methods out there that you've probably heard about suggest there's one root cause. But look, events are highly complex. In this capsizing incident, we can see that this is the case. Stability was impaired, changes had been made to docking procedures, and crew working patterns had created unsafe heuristics. Each of these also had multiple contributors. And so may be the threats in our diving. Instead of one pointy end, we may face several. A low gas situation compounded by surge, low visibility, some in, entanglement in a survey line, bit of stress. So this means that our preventive measures could really become very porous in this environment. Our next step then was to consider how the buddy system might help under multiple threats. And this was the nexus for one our first modification of the bow tie. First, in the traditional bow tie, that dark red center you see, that's an event moment. But here, the addition of the octagon in the center, that represents operational activity or task execution. And you notice that it absorbs and it sort of shrinks that event circle a little bit. Well, why? Well, this is where divers recognize an anomaly. This is where they make sense of the information. They learn in the moment. They innovate a change to the system, and that can be both to prevent or respond or both. The thing is, it's people. People create safety when we develop their capacities to anticipate and to absorb pressures and variations and disruptions. In Todd Conklin's words, people are not the problem. People are the problem solvers. I had an experience where I was watching two of my divers, and one started to deploy their SMB. 
But the buddy noticed a loop of line caught around the reel of the diver and they halted the deployment. So that's a good example of that, that anticipation of problems. Perhaps our buddy system should actually be maybe more correctly called a team diving situation. Sorry, it looks like I didn't catch up with my technology there. There's the event moment and that octagon. So team diving. Well, I'm thinking team diving rather than just buddy system because our divers are usually supported with surface personnel. This team is in part what allows a robust defense against multiple threats and that complexity that I've been talking about. If you have the entire team engaged in the process rather than sort of seeing it as one person's job, a team can make quite a difference. And when and if we include our, our surface support personnel in that team diving, a really look, who better to be able to see bad weather coming in or other vessels coming too close to the site or verifying the dive profile calculations in, during the dives than the surface attendants. So for us, this team is in part what allows a more robust defense against multiple threats and complexity. Our next modification of the bow tie became a, quite a primary emphasis in these sessions with our divers. And that was on the role of debriefings to create a feedback loop and learnings that could drive innovation and improvement. So we asked our divers to describe moments in their diving where things went well due to the buddy system, where they recognized these anomalies or potential problems and where they created some successful changes. Then we discussed how the feedback loop might work to share with others these learnings and these innovations. And honestly, this is the real gold, the learnings. It's a superpower, it truly is. We also emphasize here that this feedback loop includes reporting. In his field guide to understanding human error, Sidney Decker explains how underreporting can feed the illusion that the lack of bad news is only good news. The illusion persists that you are safe, that you are controlling risk, all risk, when you don't have any negative events. And trust me, I've heard this exact quote, we haven't killed anyone in 30 years, so we are safe. <laughs> well, look, most of us know that the absence of an event is not evidence of good practices, but not all people see it that way. And what if reporting is suppressed or discouraged? We know that there is significant risk in low reporting rates. Decker reports that high levels of reporting are positively correlated with lower levels of fatalities. So encouraging a robust reporting is important, but it can be a challenge. One of the things that can help a bit is some structure around debriefing. And one of the tools we've started to use in scientific diving is Gareth Locke's debrief model. And this just seeks to normalize candid discussion in teams around what went well and what might be improved as part of a debriefing. We included in a checklist that we use here at the University of Tasmania, and this slide shows another one that's used by Niwa in New Zealand for their scientific diving. And both of which are thanks to Gareth's debrief model. By the way, the F in debrief is follow-up, and that embraces reporting as just part of what we do. So now going back to the bow tie, we then looked at something called emergent risk. What is that? Well, emergent risk are those threats that we typically don't anticipate or expect. They're novel. These are the threats that our preventive efforts don't necessarily protect us from. Did any of our divers have examples of where the buddy system or team diving had served them in this situation? And actually there were quite a few, it's quite interesting. But how could we use this to strengthen our diving community? So communication, providing these learnings to others became the key. And once again, we note it's our frontline people, it's our divers doing the work, doing the diving that are finding these solution. So I just have to say, repeat Conklin's words yet again. People aren't the problem, they are the problem solvers. And next, we looked at the notion of recovery and we added that to our model. This is where an event has occurred and we've had to deal with the aftermath and somehow move forward. It might be a fatality or a very serious injury incident. 
And when, when I talk about recovery, I'm talking also not just at the organizational level, but at the individual level as well. And the need to be able to recover effectively. Look, this is true even when everything goes right. I experienced that myself. And incidentally, that became the title of a paper I wrote after a near fatal diving incident at the Oregon Coast Aquarium. If we had not done the work to understand what went well before, during, and after the event, the aquarium would not have been able to protect some of the key elements that led to its successful outcome. And for me, the learnings from the things that went well and the things that we could improve have just continued to serve me in my career. And it's why I believe that the ability to recover from a serious event truly hinges on the extent to which a team or an organization embraces a just culture approach. Sydney Decker's work in this area has been illuminating for me. And for those that have been in Hall 1, you just heard from another speaker that talked a bit about this very subject. The idea here is that the more we move away from a concept of blame, the closer we can get to a truly restorative position. But look, you know, I, I acknowledge this can be tricky using some of the classic investigation processes we see today. Based in part on Krista Vessel's work on language bias in accident investigations and on the work of Ivan Papulidi around learning reviews, we've recently changed our language and our processes to conduct learning reviews rather than investigations. We're not focusing on corrective actions anymore. It's just such a punitive way of looking at the world. We're focusing on improvement actions. Decker and Conklin both suggest that instead of asking who is responsible for an incident, again, that blame piece, how about we ask what is responsible? This sort of elevates the view to how the system contributes rather than just focusing on that human error causation. And finally, coming back to the notion of balance, what if we consider improvement actions across all three pillars described by Conklin? So again, that's preventive, task execution or operations, and response, or from all three points of the bow tie. Again, speaking of bow tie, well, let's go back to that model. In this model, it's the learnings, so that arrow at the top, the, the feedback loop, but also from recovery that create the power and the inertia. And honestly, the biggest conceptual shift of this model from bow tie to propeller. The model becomes dynamic, demonstrating how learning can improve the entire system including preventive, operational, and response components. So for example, with the propeller blade spinning, we might be able to deter threats coming from unusual directions. In a further adaptation to the model, the bow tie or propeller is depicted inside a sphere of influence. This represents something that some of you may have heard of, margin of maneuver. Positive influences create an outward force to maintain a buoyant sphere, providing plenty of space to create effective prevention and response capabilities. For example, when dive leaders engage the entire team in an on-site assessment and briefing, there's more opportunities to identify potential problems and then address them. As an instructor, I once learned something quite important from an open water student and it changed everything about our dive for the better. And those instructors out there, if you listen to your students, I'm sure you've experienced that as well. But then we also have negative influences, and these are the things that put pressure on the system. They can reduce the size of that sphere or the robustness or even collapse it. The smaller the sphere, the lower capacity we have to prevent and to respond to an event effectively. These negative influences, so many, they could be weather, sea conditions, tide changes, gas levels in our cylinders, getting too cold on a dive. My first dive in the Gulf of Alaska gave me some special insight into this. I thought I was well equipped. I was, gosh, I was a pretty good cold water diver. Well, look, <laughs> there's cold and there's bloody cold. 
after a 25 minute dive, I couldn't even feel my hands sufficiently to remove my own weight belt. Dry gloves gave our entire team a much larger sphere to work in, a much larger margin of maneuver. Or for example, when teams experience pressures like fatigue, pressures on their, their timeline, so tight timelines, resourcing challenges, shortcuts may disable some of the preventive measures and or reduce our ability to respond. So for example, a buddy team determined to finish their data collection may decide to go separate directions on an underwater survey to get the dive done in what they perceive will be half the time. For a team diving in Alaska a couple of years ago, this meant a delayed rescue, a very delayed rescue, a devastating lack of response capability, and basically a total dysfunction of margin of maneuver. So indeed, an unbalanced propeller can also remove our margin of maneuver or even completely collapse the system. And so that brings us back to our original assertion that putting all our eggs in the prevention basket does not serve us. In fact, it, it can really lead to a failed or a zero response. On the other hand, a balanced propeller kept in motion with an effective feedback loop and the capability to recover from events improves our capacity to prevent, respond, to innovate, and to learn. So using this simple, this model as a simple visual framework and an appreciative inquiry approach to explore the buddy system with our divers, look, it, it resulted in way more than a simple understanding of this as a important control measure. It got us talking. <laughs> it activated the idea of learning and improving. And it helped us begin to share a new language of safety differently, moving away from that idea of blame. <clears throat> but I'd also like to share with you two of the higher level learnings for us in this process. And look, one, quite frankly, was the depth of impact that the buddy system or this team diving approach has on our diving. This truly is one of our most critical contributors to successful outcomes for a scientific diving. This isn't just about safety. In fact, it's, it's almost not about safety at all. It's more about effectiveness. It's more about reliability. But I can tell you, if we had, didn't do the work to unpack it, we would not have understood that very thoroughly. Secondly, the other learning for us is that the best place to consider how we use team diving in our science and in our research activities at the university is in the research design process. Now look, this probably sounds really obvious. It's at the point of creating a project when we plan how we're gonna collect data using the buddy system that we get the best results. If we come in later and we impose the buddy system on a project that did not leverage its benefits to begin with, we are just pushing the boulder uphill. This is where we get people saying things like, look, we can't afford to use the buddy system. We don't have the funding in this project for two divers working together right on top of each other. So there's some learnings in that statement as well. But the other one we get a lot is, look, our data collecting protocol does not fit with the model of two divers staying together. And there's, there's some issues there that are really beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. But to put it simply, we need to design the research so that it doesn't just include the buddy system as sort of a compliance issue, but it actually leverages its benefits. <clears throat> Excuse me. There's one more burning issue that came out of these sessions and discussions. And it's something I wanna share with you because quite frankly, I think we can just do, we can do it a lot better, a lot better. This is a thing that pretty much everyone does in one form or another. Though some of us are using some fairly prescriptive tools that maybe are not as useful as we might like. This is a subject that apparently 
can break, make the brain go blank and fuzzy and the eyes roll right back in the head. If you want to pretty much immediately disengage someone, start talking about this. What am I talking about? Risk assessment. I even hate using the word, the term. <laughs> In a moment, I'm going to circle back to the beginning of this session where I mentioned Todd Conklin's refreshingly simple approach to risk assessment. But before I do, I wonder, how much do you love this matrix? <clears throat> how much do you love that likelihood scale here at the bottom of the slide that you see that it's based on? And jumping down to the next slide, how about the consequence scale? The co and th by the way, these, these are just examples that I grabbed. Um, there's lots of them out there, and this is not a full consequence scale. It's just a, a chunk of one. But how much do you really love this stuff? And furthermore, how well do your teams understand the process and the language of this thing we're calling risk assessment? So that's that bit in the middle I've circled. So inherent risk, residual risk, um, this part here, these measures, hierarchy of control, all that nonsense. You know, maybe some of you work where you don't have high turnover like we do with students <laughs> in a university. But we just find that for the most part, people really struggle with a lot of this. So how well do your teams get it? How well does this matrix actually work to as you intend it to, or to help you understand and mitigate risk. Look, I know that a lot of us are using some version of this template, but I realize that not everyone here does. So hang in there with me for just a moment because I am going to come back to that refreshingly simple in a moment, and that's gonna be useful to everybody. But here's my soapbox. As I understand it, this matrix and template originally comes from the insurance industry. For most of my career, I've attempted to use variations of this matrix, but continue to find that our users just, they don't get it. Or here's the other problem. There's some that get it and they have workarounds. <laughs> so one workaround is everything that you see, everything that you see on a risk assessment just turns out to be low. Those are the green bits you see on the screen. But I've even had people adjust the inherent risks to be higher so that it appears the risk control measures actually reduce the risk. And the residual risk can then be reported as being lower in response. So in other words, you make this quite high and then over here, it looks like it's much lower. And look, actually, I kind of get why they're doing that. Because otherwise you go from a low to low. And a, man, in a lot of the stuff we do in diving, we go from low to low or from medium to medium. So one might ask, sorry, <laughs> why are we bothering to impose a risk control measure that does not lower the final risk? Great question. But perhaps the biggest time waster is the discussions around what the likelihood is of any given hazard or risk. Hours people will spend on this. And I can't see your faces, but I'm guessing even this brief foray into risk assessment has put you all in a bit of brain fade. So never mind, because now I'm going to go back to my rescuer, Todd Conklin. And what I've begun doing is short circuiting these sort of time wasters, these discussions that go on and on about likelihood. And I'm just simply asking the teams to answer these three questions. When we, when we do this job, what will hurt you? What will kill you? When that happens, and not if, but when, what keeps you from dying? And is that enough? The cool bit for me is what, what we've experienced is when we use these questions in combination with brainstorming and using that bow tie, that propeller model, it's amazing. It seems to activate a much higher, higher level of, of understanding. I am hoping at some point to sort of formalize this in a way that might work for our frontline users way more effectively than the matrix, but also still work for some of our higher level audit and risk people at the university. And look, 
I still appreciate the wisdom behind the idea of consequence and likelihood. Truly, I do. But my current opinion is that it could be used as a checking mechanism, more as a principle and a mindset rather than a prescriptive process. I'd love to hear your comments and your feedback or other suggestions you might have on, on this topic. So please feel free to email, email me or meet me in the lobby later. So our takeaway messages. We start from the bottom. Risk assessment does not need to make your brain go numb. It really doesn't. Simplify it. People aren't the problem. They're the problem solvers. They are your gold. And speaking of gold, learning is what from what's working well as well as what's not working as well. That, that's a superpower. This is truly the gold. You can create these feedback loops for yourself. And simple debriefings can improve not just your safety, but your efficiency and the way you work. So in the end, we need to be able to respond when things go badly, because they will. And prevention, great investment, but it's not enough. Before we wrap up, I would like to acknowledge my co-author, Fiona McCarthy, who couldn't join us today, and our amazing collab collaborators in developing this model and this session. Also, I've listed some references. The, the paper that, that, that goes with this has more of a full bibliography, but gosh, there's a lot of people who have contributed in this area of safety science. It's really an amazing thing. In an effort to keep the propeller turning, I invite you to jump into the feedback and learning, learnings loop. Please share your comments and questions with us so that we can continue to improve. And you can do that by email as well. Thank you again for your time and attention. And I do have one parting shot for you here. This is a still grab from a video that was taken by a friend of mine in um, diving in Hawaii. So it's a little grainy, but it's a great one. It's, uh, you can see all the divers lined up. They're looking in a cavern for a seal, which is amusingly right behind them. A seal's watching them. So certainly, don't forget to look behind you because it may inform where you go in the future. Thank you again for your time and attention. I'd be happy to take questions at this stage. Thank you, Valerie. And uh, now, dear participants, please go to the I have a question table. You find it to the left in the map of the conference hall. And while we are waiting for you to Go there with your question and invite you to the stage. Uh, Valerie, I have a question for you. Uh, I think uh, one of the expressions we hear a lot when people are talking about diving safety is mindset. It's all about mindset. Can you please try to put mindset in the framework of your model so we can have a small chat about how you react upon that uh, idea, mindset as a, as a driver for safety. Sure, thank you. Um, well, if you think of mindset uh, from sort of a decision theory and general systems theory view, uh, and I'm, I'm thinking here of people like Carol Dweck, Klein, and Cherry, it's described as a set, sort of a set of assumptions, uh, motion, uh, methods, or, or sometimes uh, notions that shape how you make sense of the world. Mindset influences how you think, how you feel, and how you behave in any given situation. So yeah, mindset plays an important role in how we use this model. Uh, and if you want to step into the safety differently space, then your language, for example, your reactions to events, your leadership are really important. And it, those are all, and I'm all speaking about those in terms of, the, of your mindset. How you respond to failure matters. How leaders act and respond counts. I'm actively asking our dive coordinators to embrace a mindset that includes this concept of error is normal, blame fixes nothing, learning and improving is vital, and it's a deliberate thing. Um, so again, it's it's not how you, it's it's not so much about this blame thing. It's more about how you respond to failure that matters, and that the mindset of 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 those those principles of human performance that that um, Todd Conklin talks about. Okay, Valerie, thank you. Let's see what Laura has to ask you. Laura, welcome. 
Hi, hi. Um, thank you, Valerie, for um, a great talk there. There's a lot of components of that I was really interested in, in in the model, but I actually wanted to focus on more of a kind of practical question from the Todd Conklin questions and using that risk assessment. So, so just to explain the context of that, I used to dive in a club where we would have the the risks and how we prevent them stated in a big list that we'd kind of read out to the divers and I was finding that people just switch off so in the new club I've been experimenting with kind of doing what those questions suggest which is like what do we think is going to be a problem for us you know how are we going to avoid that and then I was kind of intrigued by that is, is that enough question at the bottom so I kind of have two questions about that one is um you know I can imagine doing this, asking the questions, and then it's the same answers every time. So see people get bored of it. So I don't know, keeping that stimulated and keeping it going so that people are learning new things each time. But also I wondered if you could say a bit more about that. Is that enough point of the question? Um, I, I just, yeah, I just wanted to expand on that a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you, Laura. Um, in my view, this idea of risk assessment has to happen in two pieces. And one obviously is the planning. So that's the bit where you, you know, you especially if you're doing, you know, sort of stock standard recreational diving, that could get really boring really quickly. I totally mm -hmm. agree. So those are things that we just reinforce in our in our briefings to a large extent. Um, but when you're planning a dive and when you're modeling the behaviors of, with your students of how to do it, you can sort of handpick things that are relevant to the type of diving that you're doing. But the other really important bit, and this is where these three questions absolutely shine, especially the last question, is when we're using in a, in a, in a dynamic sense. So that's you're on the boat, you're getting ready to jump in the water and you notice something occurring. Um, or, or, or something's changed about what you need to do. You had you need to revisit it. You need to do it dynamically. So, what could hurt us right now? What's changed that could hurt us right now? What are we going to do about that? And, and look, is that going to be enough? And if the answer is no, that's not going to be enough. And and people can't come up with other mitigating factors. What do you do? Well, perhaps you abort the dive. So it can be a really powerful tool. And that not enough. That's the golden one for deciding on the thumbing a dive, on the canceling of a dive, etc. So that that one to me is really the magic in that. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. It just really, it just helped me to see it a bit more. So I guess that is that enough question is kind of a closed yes no, but then it also kind of leads into as you say that do we cancel the dive? What do we do about it? Kind of discussion. Yeah, you may end up with a maybe, mm -hmm. um, and we actually use a traffic light. Um, actually, there's a couple models out there. The, the green, amber, red model of risk assessment, mm -hmm. the GAR mm -hmm. stuff. The maybe is the yellow, and so that's where you need to take a step, few steps back and and really analyze what other mitigating things do we need? What, how else can we make ourselves safe here? Um, so yeah, at some point you need to diverge from the maybe and decide a yes yeah. or a no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Laura, no, great. Laura, please, please uh, hold on and stay here at the stage. I think we should let Diane uh, put forward her question too, so Valerie gets more more wood on her fire here. Hi, Valerie. Thank you very much for your presentation. So I, my question is about the propeller model. I'm, I'm loving it. You know, the this kind of the dynamism of it, um, and and the feedback loops, wonderful. So I've got two questions. They're they're related. The first question is, and this is about embedment and usage. Okay, so the first question is, uh, do does does an organization or a team need to have seen the blow tie model before um, for them to then understand how it can become a propeller and, and, and what kind of things have you you done to help help people understand it and then on the other side have you been involved with teams who use the bow tie model and think that the a propeller model model is heresy and that you have uh, and how have you overcome that so it's it's one is about embedding from new and the other one is about rejection due to the fact that it's um it may not fit, fit people's mental models of risk <laughs> a great question yeah um so I'm going to answer the second one first. Uh, a couple people have uh, like, oh, heresy. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, um, what are you talking about? This is not the bowtie model. And it's like, yeah, you're right. It, it's not. It's a, it's a pretty significant departure from the bowtie. Um, 
it, it uses some of its, its benefits, but it is definitely a different mental model and it's a different way of thinking. So um, my, my sort of view of the world there is, is everyone sees this stuff differently and, and some models resonate with some people and, and they don't resonate with others and that's actually okay. So this is just one way of, of sort of adapting a bow tie. Um, it's certainly not as complex as the ones that you see um, you know, some of the other researchers have used and some of the safety experts have used, but yeah, I, I accept if it doesn't work for other people, that's absolutely fine. And, you know, we've actually even um, explored a little bit of how to, how to, to talk to those people in a different framework, but, um, and sorry, now I've totally forgotten the first bit of your question. Um, uh, the first bit, bit is, um, oh, for people who've never seen bow ties before, how do yeah. you um, yeah. hold their hands to uh, to take them from bow tie to propeller? Yeah, and and interestingly, when we first started this, n almost none of them in the room. There were forty of them in the room, and almost none of them had seen the bow tie. They had no idea what I was talking about, and it was quite a range. It was everything from very low level divers to high level academics and everybody in between, you know, dive masters, instructors, etc. cetera. Um, most of them though, were not familiar with safety science at all. Uh, and so most of them had never seen the boat. I think there were two people that kind of went, yeah, isn't it a bit more complicated than that? So they, they kind of knew what I meant a little bit. Um, and we really didn't iterate the model to get to a propeller uh, uh, until after we had started this process. So we were just using the model as sort of a, a framework to brainstorm as a way of thinking things. And the further we got along and then we came back to the team that originally we had discussed this with and we introduced this idea of the propeller. But again, it was a mixed audience. Some people in the room had now seen the bow tie, um, some hadn't. And we found that just by walking through the, the steps fairly quickly um, that they they sort of got it uh, pretty fast. So I don't think you need to necessarily be familiar with the bow tie to understand the idea of the propeller. Well, thank you very much. So I'm uh, going to be um, using this with a vengeance. So thank you so much. Oh, well, high praise. I saw most of your session and just loved it. <laughs> oh, thank ah, you. Well. speakers uh, loving each other. Good. Can we please make room for Seb with a final question to Valerie? Hi, Valerie. Thank you. That's uh, it's, uh, a wonderful session. I, I hate to diverge from uh, the practicalities, but I think this does slightly pick, uh, dovetail with um, Diane's question, which is within the context of the, the sort of established legal framework with health and safety compliance in scientific diving and the, I, I'm assuming Australia's model is probably similar to the UK's model. I don't know if that's correct. It, uh, it, some shared characteristics, yes. Yeah. Have you found that the, the more modern um, safety science procedures uh, have fit well within the existing sort of compliance frameworks or has the, is there a concern, uh, for example, within the university's um, you know, liability and compliance teams that what you're bringing in might depart significantly enough from the legal framework as to um, present problems? Um, I, it's, it's, I'm sorry the question is not, uh, not more fully formed, but I, I, so much of what this conference is about and what I've learned from Gareth and spoken with Gareth, it's, these are some brilliant ideas and they, they really are personally and with a lot of divers and diving risk managers and operations managers I've spoken to are very popular. But the one question that keeps coming back is, can we do this legally? And I, I suppose I wanted to ask your personal experiences since you have this position and you are governed by legislation. Yeah, great question, Seb. And actually, I get what you're you're sort of alluding to there. Um, and the simple answer is right now it's a very mixed bag. We're very fortunate that the uh, WorkSafe Tasmania, our regulator, is right on top of all of this safety science stuff. And they, they point blank told me, look, we're going to be very, uh, it's very unlikely that we're going to, you know, fine or be punitive against a particular individual person. We're going to be looking higher up the chain uh, at the officers and the, that level. Um, so yes, I think it is working in that space, but 
at the same time, there's stuff happening nationally that's quite unnerving. So it, it's a mixed bag. Um, but I'm I'm undertaking some training right now in learning reviews, and we're diving into this very space. So I'm I'm hoping to to write some more uh, papers and things in in that space. So keep your eyes peeled. Wonderful. Thank you. Great presentation. Well, thank you, Seb, for your question. We're supposed to end this uh, seminar now, but Garrett wants to ask you a question too, right? <laughs> And since actually, he's the plan of a boss, I don't. Uh, that's I don't okay. So actually, it wasn't a uh, a question for Valerie. It was more to follow up with Seb and say, um, if you make contact with Adam Johns on LinkedIn, um, who's been involved in aviation through Luton Airport and now works at Doppler and Light Railway, they have done a fantastic job with working with the HSE in the UK about bringing safety to safety differently into their own health and safety management bit. So that was what I was going to say. And anybody who's interested in this sort of bringing it in from the legal perspectives, uh, Adam and Simon Bound uh, have done a fantastic effort in that area. That was all I was going to say. Thank Thanks, you, Anders. Garrett. Garrett, Garrett. We're the wrap up and please go to the uh, main conference lobby. There you find Valerie at the table called uh, speak with the speaker from uh, hall one and she will go there now so if you didn't have time to pose your question or want to have more chat with valerie please go there and be back here top of the hour for the next interesting seminar see you later bye bye thank you well, thanks valerie